Awesome, thank you. So welcome. Um, we want to get started today. Right now I have um, Bill Hedgecock, who's a professor at University of Minnesota. Um, and I invited him today to talk about his field uh, that we're calling neuromarketing. Um, so Bill, why don't you um, feel free to share your screen um, and then tell a little bit more about your work. Um, and then we'll finish up with questions. If anyone has questions throughout, feel free to put them in the chat. Great. Uh, thanks. Uh, I assume you can see this okay, right? We can. Great. Uh, okay, so I'm Bill Hedgecock. Thanks for coming. Um, I do research in marketing and I use neuroscience techniques when I'm studying people. Uh, so people call it neuromarketing. You know, uh, academics tend to call it uh, consumer neuroscience. Uh, Maybe formally it's decision neuroscience, it doesn't matter. Uh, the point is that I look at kind of human behavior, especially in marketing, and, and I like to use these other uh, techniques. Um, you know, uh, Becca asked me to, to mention like, how did I get here? Uh, and I could talk about this more if you're interested, but, but basically the as, idea is this. Um, well, I was born in Waukesha, Wisconsin. No. Uh, so I went to McAllister College at, for my undergraduate degrees. And honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, in fact, I, I thought I wanted to be an English major at first. I changed my mind. Uh, quickly, I decided econ was a better place to be for me. But I also took a bunch of psychology. So I ended up double majoring in both. And, I, and with both of those majors, they like you to take math. So I minored in, in math. Um, but I did not have explicit plans um, uh, to get a PhD in business. In fact, I, I did not even know a PhD in business existed uh, until after I graduated uh, from college. So after I graduated, again, uh, when I was looking for jobs, actually, I was interested in the Peace Corps at first. Uh, that's a long story, so I won't get into it. But I ended up landing a different job at first because I had to pay off student loans. Uh, I worked in marketing at places like Carlson, uh, Visa, and Great Clips. And the work I did in these areas uh, was what you would call big data now. So I, I analyzed um, transactions. So at like Visa, I had credit card transactions and I could look at and see what kind of uh, preferences people had and what sort of promotions to send them and, and so on. Uh, then, then what happened was uh, actually I had a great job and it's... Um, I don't know, maybe it was a bad idea that I quit it. Um, uh, but while I enjoyed it, I decided I wasn't digging as deeply into these behaviors as I wanted. Um, uh, you know, I did things that help companies make better decisions, but I wanted to, to understand the behaviors even more uh, than I could. So I, I went and got a PhD in business where I have an opportunity to study these things uh, more deeply. Um, Honestly, maybe a little too deeply. I'd, I'd, in my ideal world, it'd be somewhere in between uh, industry and academia. Uh, when I got to Minnesota, again, I actually thought I would do big data because uh, that's what my experience was in. Honestly, it would have been a great career path. Uh, but I got exposed to some of the psychology stuff that I liked before um, and, and, and some neuroscience. I just I had an opportunity at school just to go outside of the business school and look at these things. And I saw people talking about fMRI and I thought that's really cool. Um, even today I go in and we scan people's brains and you know, you put them in a scanner and you see a picture of the brain and you're like, that's, it's, you know, magic. It's crazy. Uh, so it's cool. Uh, so I ended up getting a degree in neuromarketing uh, before people really were talking about it. Uh, after that, I went to the University of Iowa, where I was faculty member for 10 years. And a few years ago, I came back to Minnesota. So I'm, I'm in, um, at the University of Minnesota right now. Uh, and I plan to stay here right now. I shouldn't say right now. It sounds like I'm trying to leave or something, which I'm not. Uh, okay. okay, so this brings me to a question, actually. I, I want to tell you a, about a little research I, I want to do. I don't know if any of you are going to play along, but please do. Um, in your chat, I'm curious if you can tell me who do you think is going to be happier? Uh, someone who receives, receives their Amazon delivery in two days or three days, right? So is, is two days going to make people happier or three? Oh my gosh. Thank you for playing along. Wow. We should get bonus prizes. Two days, two days. Two days. All right. As soon as possible. Right now, by the way, I, I, I said earlier, I came from Iowa. We didn't get stuff in three days either. Right. So I was like, that, that'd be fantastic. But now that I'm back in Minnesota, we get our deliveries fast. Two days is good. Every once in a while, I wish it was one day. 
right? But let me ask one more question. Uh, who's going to be happier? Someone who wins the Olympic silver model or silver medal or bronze medal? Who's happiest, silver or bronze? There's no, the Amazon have, question. Now now everyone's here. Come on. <laughs> All right. Silver, silver. Ah, depends on how close silver is to gold. Very good. You're getting it. All right. So here's the thing, right? Objectively, these are kind of the same question, uh, but a lot of people are like, well, it's actually a little different, right? Everyone wants a two day delivery more than three day, but silver versus bronze is interesting, right? In the case of silver, right? Silver might go, man, I wish I was gold, right? Where bronze is like, I'm just happy I wasn't the person sitting down and not in the metal stand. Right, so it turns out there actually is some research that has shown that bronze medalists are happier, and and I'm going to show you some of the stuff that we've done, uh, just in case you're curious. Uh, and this is related to something called counterfactuals. So let me tell you a quick story. It's funny. Um, if you're over 30, I know you'll remember this. If you're under, uh, hopefully you've seen the memes about this. Uh, so in the 2012 Olympics, uh, there was Kayla Maroney, who was a, an Olympic gymnast for the United States, and she was known for being a tremendous vaulter, okay? Uh, I wish I had other video of other people. Other people doing this vault would be like down here. They'd be much lower on the vault. She was just fantastic. Now, by the way, don't take my word for it. Here is a picture of the Olympic judges <laughs> looking at her. And here, this lady's mouth is actually wide open watching. I mean, they watch all the best gymnasts in the world. And they're like, wow, what did I just see here? She was incredible. Uh, she, she was expected to get gold. She won every single time she went to a competition. It wasn't even a close call. But when she went for a vault, this is what happened. She landed on her butt, right? And one of my favorite things about the Olympics is how everyone knows nothing about gymnastics. But when someone lands on the ground, like everyone knows that's not good, right? Everyone becomes a professional judge. It turns out her vault was still so great that even though she landed on her butt, she got a silver medal, but this was her expression, right? And this is the meme that you might have seen. I, there was just a commercial this year uh, that, that, that went back and used this, uh, by the way. Yeah, Guy, thank you, uh, Geico. Uh, I, I'm the one in marketing. I should know this. I'm sorry, but um, I knew it's out there. Uh, so what we did is some facial expression encoding, uh, right? So how do we know who's happier, gold, uh, met, uh, silver, or bronze? We can ask them, and other people have done that. But the problem is maybe when they answer, they, they know they should be happy, so they don't respond truthfully. Or, or you know, there's all these other kinds of reasons why, uh, why asking them, you might not get an uh, honest result. So what we did is facial expression encoding. We went to the Olympics uh, and... and um, uh, looked up facial or looked up photos of people who are on the medal stand. So here's an example on in the Summer Olympics, uh, the medal stand for the 100, where Jamaica got first, second, and third. Uh, they were clearly crushing it in in uh, the 100. And uh, we looked for medal stand photos where you had all the medalists and you could actually see their faces, uh, and that's it. And we took every single photo we could uh, that had those. Uh, that had that. Now, every once in a while, they, they had their face obscured by something, so we didn't use those photos. But we ended up with uh, 413 facial expressions uh, that we could evaluate um, uh, to see who was happiest, right? Uh, and how the facial expression software works is this. Uh, the software comes along, it looks at a photo or video for that matter. It finds landmarks on the face, so it knows like where the sides of your mouth are, where your nose is. It could tell if your, your head is at an angle or straight on. It finds where your ears are, where parts of your eyes are. And based on the relationship between you know how far apart these things are and how close they are to certain landmarks and other ones, uh, it can determine the facial expression you have with a pretty high degree of reliability. So like smiles, it can, it can uh, identify like 98% of the time accurately. Okay, so we use the software to go through all of these photos and figure out who had the biggest smiles and who had less smiles or no smile at all. Now, by the way, it turns out, uh, like in these photos, the vast majority of the time people are smiling. I mean, it's really rare I, to have someone like showing a facial expression of disgust or sadness on the metal stand. Like that doesn't happen, you know, neutral occasionally, but but almost everyone was smiling. But you can see. You know, right here, this person's smiling a lot where this guy is not smiling quite as much, right? All right, so what did we find? 
uh, what we found was this. It turns out uh, silver medalist uh, had the, the smallest smiles, bronze medalists were happier, and gold was happiest. So I actually, I didn't ask you all. Turns out gold's great. Uh, so everyone's happy when they get gold. Uh, but bronze, one argument is that bronze, you know, is saying, hey, I could be fourth place and not on the medal stand. That's a bummer. Or silver is like, I wish I was gold. But it turns out there's two explanations for this. Uh, the one is the counterfactual I just told you. The other one is it could be based on their expectation before the race, right? So potentially systematically, silver medalists were supposed to get gold, right? So it's not just that they're jealous, but they actually think like I was meant to get gold and I just had a bad race. And that makes sense, right? You could be the best athlete out there, but you have to be the best athlete that day, right? Where on the other hand, bronze might often be fourth or fifth place. You just had a good day and they just made it in uh, to bronze. And it turns out that's true. But statistically, we could disentangle those two effects. And, and here's what we found. So silver medalists uh, who got what they expected uh, were right here kind of in the middle. But if they did better than expected, they actually were more happy. Uh, and if they did worse than expected, they actually were close to neutral. So silver medalists who um, did worse than they expected uh, actually had a neutral expression almost uh, or most of the time. Uh, again, it's awesome to be gold. Uh, there's no way to be better than expectation uh, or, or worse than expectation. Uh, and even being better didn't help much. But here you have bronze medalist. If you're a bronze medalist and you were supposed to not be on the medal stand, you were just as happy as a gold medalist. It was fantastic. It was a good day, right? Um, so why is this interesting to someone like me, right? Well, people, when they're evaluating an outcome, they don't just look at the objective outcome, right? So I'm not just looking at, did I get gold, bronze, or gold, silver, or bronze, or did I get my delivery in two days versus three? We're also uh, affected by expectations, right? So I expected to do well versus not. So for example, when I'm at Iowa, if I expect my delivery from Amazon to take three days and it takes two, it's fantastic. But if I'm in the Twin Cities, and, and I expect my delivery in two days or in one day and it comes in two, I'm, I'm upset, I'm disappointed, right? But you also have these upward and downward comparisons. So I'm looking at you know, alternative outcomes that could have occurred, all right? So that's the quick version of that. Now, actually I had another example, although I'm trying to think, how, Becca, tell me how much time do I have? Uh, you have 15 minutes total. All right, well, we can do another one. There's plenty of time, if that's all right. Uh, so here's something about observing product touch. So, um, and man, we should market this better, but uh, I didn't come up with the title. Um, basically, the idea is this, we know touch is important. And what I mean by that is uh, when people go in and look at a product, they like to touch the product and it affects their subsequent behavior. And it's important for many reasons. One, you know, of course, you might want to touch a shirt or something to see, is it, is it you know, soft or scratchy? That makes sense. We also know interpersonal touch. This is how people get relationships. If it, uh, that's important. Um, but the one I'm going to focus on is, is something about increasing ownership. Basically, if I give you a product to, to hold on to or touch, even if it provides no information, it increases my sense of ownership. So for example, man, I, I hate to admit this, but years ago, I sold knives door to door. I know. Um, and uh, one of the sales techniques was to get people to actually put the knife in their hand. And sure, they could evaluate, you know, the weight of the knife, but I think everyone kind of knew that. But by actually holding on to it, like it, it increases a sense of ownership. And now if I give it to you, it's like I'm giving something up, right? Uh, as opposed to if you weren't touching or holding the product. Um, so we were curious about this phenomenon, but in, uh, in an online setting. So what happens when people start buying products online, right? So it, it could be that you're going online and touch is important, but you, you clearly can't physically touch a product online, right? How, how do I reach out and grab it? Um, also, it could be disgusting. So we know from other research, if I see someone else touch a product, I like the product less, okay? So if I watch someone online grab a product, if it doesn't seem like me, it'll make me like it less. And then clearly with, you know, with Omicron and, 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 uh, and COVID, right? There's this question of contagion. So if you see someone touch a product, would, you, would it seem kind of like contagious and I don't want to touch that product and I don't want to own it anymore, okay? Mm -hmm. So to give you an idea, we actually ran boatloads of studies, but they, uh, the, before we ran any of the studies, we, did, we, we looked at Instagram. 
So we went out to Instagram and just um, just uh, scraped. Uh, we used software to grab uh, all these images and also information about the images. Uh, so for example, we knew what how people commented, but we also knew if they liked it, if they shared the image uh, with other people and so on. Uh, and what we did is we had Instagram posts where, where there was no hand in the image. We also found posts where there was a hand, but they weren't actually touching the product. So, you know, here's this person, but they're holding a pen, but they're not touching the phone. And then we had Instagram images where they're actually touching the product itself. And our guess was that when you're interacting with the device, you actually hold it in your hand, it would increase engagement. So people would end up sharing it more and liking it more and, and, and so on. Uh, and that's what we found. We found that posts with, um, uh, with a hand touching the product were, were more successful and more effective than ones where they weren't touching it or where there's no hand at all, okay? And this is even after we statistically controlled for a number of factors. But um, the thing with going out and looking at images online is, is uh, there may be some other explanations that we couldn't observe. So, so we went into the lab and we ran honestly, more than a dozen studies. I uh, got a little out of hand. Oh, that was a pun, unintentional, <laughs> uh, but it got a little crazy. Um, so here's, here's what the studies look like uh, in the lab. Uh, the first one was uh, we had a no hand condition. So this is like, we'd have a picture or a video, or we have a virtual reality study uh, where there's no hand, but there's just a cursor that kind of points at the product. Here's one where, uh, unfortunately the video is not working for some reason but the hand comes out and, and gets close to it, but doesn't actually touch the product. And here's one where the hand comes out and touches the product. And what you're gonna find is in all of our studies, in, in the pictures or the videos that we have, when the hand touches the product, it increases how much people are willing to pay for the product. It increases purchase intention and psychological ownership. So it's not like they feel they literally own uh, the shirt, uh, but they kind of feel an ownership to it. Now. I admit that sounds weird, but but for all of us who have been in a classroom, let me use this example. When you walk into class the first day, right? You grab a seat and 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 after that day, you kind of own that seat, right? So you're sitting there and the next day, if you walk in, or let's say after two weeks of sitting in the same seat, the third week you walk in and someone's sitting in your seat, you're like, hey, that's my seat, right? That's psychological ownership. You don't You don't legally own that seat but not only do you think you own it, but other people in the room agree, right? They're like, whoa, that's, they sat there for two weeks. What are you doing, right? So that's what this psychological ownership is. Um, like I said, we ran about a dozen studies. We used different hands. So we had this like fake blue hand out there. We used different actions. So rubbing it with the back of your hand versus knocking on it with your hand. We had different settings. So we did it in virtual reality. And basically if, if your hand doesn't touch it, it doesn't work. Uh, if you get really weird, so it's like knocking on it with the back of your hand, um, <laughs> then vicarious touch doesn't work. But even stroking it with your back of your hand increased psychological ownership and how much people were willing to pay. Um, here's a virtual reality study, uh, just to give you an idea of what it looked like. So uh, participants came in, uh, they could look down, see their hands, they look around. By the way, if you get dizzy, just look away from the screen. You'll be okay. <laughs> uh, people, you know, it touches, but then eventually they walk up there and the hand actually comes out. And in this case, the hand's going to touch the product, but in other cases we restricted it. So the hand would touch like a bar next to it, but not actually the product itself. Okay. And the idea here was to see, again, does this increase the likelihood people would buy it and how much they would pay? Uh, and the answer is yes. So, so the, the version where they touched it was more successful. Now I should say we went out to companies, um, virtual, you know, uh, storefronts and stuff, and companies are not doing this today. Uh, companies tend to have a cursor that goes out there. They don't actually have like a hand that goes out there and touches the product, but, but we think that's a mistake. Uh, so why does this happen? I kind of glossed over the details for sake of time, uh, but it has to do with body ownership. Um, uh, the arm going out there uh, people feel as if uh, that's actually an extension of their body, right? It's, it's not like they actually think it's their hand, but it, it kind of feels like that's them interacting with a product. So for the people who felt body ownership, they, they felt like that arm was their arm. Uh, they had an increased psychological ownership, which made them pay more for the product. 
Um, and and that, that's the quick version of that. Um, now, we did the study during uh, COVID, which, by the way, like, like what a bummer. Um, here we are doing a study or research about people touching products. And then, and then we got a time where we couldn't have them touch products. I mean, you know, um, the Institutional Review Board would not approve studies where we interacted with people, let alone have someone else touch a product, you know, whatever. So we ran an online study to say, say hey, now that it's during COVID, maybe this phenomenon is going to change. Maybe now uh, people won't like a product if they see a virtual hand touch it. Uh, so what we did is we ran an online study and we made it very obvious uh, or very salient in people's minds about uh, COVID. So we actually took a CDC ad about stay healthy, wash your hands, whatever, or we had a, a control condition where they where we didn't talk about germs. Um, uh, and we found that the effect still worked. Uh, so even during COVID, when we reminded people about germs, when they see a virtual hand touching it, uh, they still uh, uh, wanted to buy the product more. Now, by the way, we didn't test this in a real world setting, uh, in an actual retail setting, um, in person, the, the IRB wouldn't approve that. Um, but I doubt it would have worked there. I, I think in a real setting, right? I mean, you see these people like wearing gloves and so on, like it wouldn't have worked there, but virtually um, uh, people seem to realize, you know, it's not in person and, and I'm not concerned about contagion. So our summary on that one is anytime you do digital content, so online, uh, you know, Instagram posting, uh, uh, unboxing videos, uh, photos, uh, virtual stores, whatever, it's, it's good to show a hand touching the product and it should engage the product in a meaningful way. Although I could tell you, uh, we tried to make it unmeaningful in a lot of ways and it was really hard. So you don't have to overthink this, but you know, don't have them knock on it upside down. That's ridiculous, but otherwise, just, just touching it in some sort of way is important. Actual touch, so if they're in a real store, uh, that provides information and increase, increases psychological ownership. In the case of vicarious touch, there's no information, right? You're not actually touching the product, but it still increases psychological ownership. Uh, and we thought that was interesting and, uh, and particularly relevant right now. Um, I'll skip that. Uh, and at some point I wanted to talk about research ethics, but uh, maybe, maybe I should pause and see if there's any questions or, or, or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's fine. I think, um, you know, I, I, part of why I wanted to have you here too, is thinking yeah. through this, this piece of, of the ethics and sort of what are the, what yeah. are the ways that you can explore information and, and think about behavioral projects differently. So I think your examples present that well. So great. if folks have questions now, that's great, but otherwise you can jump into this. Yeah. Okay. Never heard, heard touch. Yeah, actually, you know, we presented this touch um, uh, study before uh, to people in industry who are doing marketing now. And we've heard back from a lot of people that just from trial and error, they figured that out. So people who do a lot of Instagram posting, you know, they weren't thinking about the touch research or psychological ownership but they've done hundreds and hundreds and they're like, yeah, every time there's a hand in there and it's interacting, you know, like, like they realize that that's more effective than these other settings. Um, uh, so we've heard from a lot of people who are like, well, great. I mean, th like we kind of clued into that, but it's nice now to know why that sort of occurs. Although again, not everyone's clued in because all these virtual stores are not doing it yet. They're all using a cursor, which seems uh, less effective. Yeah. Um, but yeah, ethics. So, uh, so I not only do research, but I also teach it to PhDs and, and MBAs and undergrads for that matter. Um, so this is something we have to think about all the time, you know, particularly when you're doing marketing research, um, but honestly, any uh, research. Um, there's a lot of ways to think about it, but one framework I think is useful it comes from the National Institute of Health. So that's the NIH. The National Institute of Health says there's seven principles to think about for research ethics. Now, by the way, uh, why do I know this? Uh, we cannot do research at the university without abiding by this, these rules. Uh, uh, if we don't, uh, it's not like I go to jail, uh, but the National Institute of Health no longer funds research at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and I'll tell you, Minnesota prefers to get funding from the NIH more than they like me. Uh, so if I violate this, I'm gone. Um, uh, so here are the principles 
the idea that there should be social and clinical value. So the basic idea here is if I'm going to do research um, and there, there might be some positives and negatives, you know, th there better be some positive that will help society uh, or help the individual, right? If there isn't like now we're not doing research, like why are we even doing this? Scientific validity is related, but it's not just could there be potential, but it's is there potential from doing your research? So basically, did you design this well enough that um, that, that I might actually glean some information to help get our societal value. Uh, there's this question about fair subject selection. So who's involved in the study? Um, uh, you don't want people in, involved if, if they could be hurt, but on the flip side, you want to include everyone feasible so that everyone can benefit from the results as well. And actually just a, a quick side note, when I first started doing brain imaging work, uh, sometimes the IRB was telling we, we should uh, um, uh, not include women unless they were uh, on birth control, uh, because the concern was even though that it, it's, it's teeny tiny, but, but potentially if someone was pregnant, there could be a negative impact. Uh, they've changed their mind on that because actually there just isn't a negative, anyway, it's hard to explain, but, but, but some of the benefit to women wasn't happening because they were excluding women from the research, which was not it had negative consequences as well, right? So fair subject selection is both excluding people who shouldn't be in it, but also including everyone so they can receive the benefits of the research. Uh, there should be a favorable risk benefit ratio. So, you know, um, if you're doing uh, research that could put someone at risk, um, there better be a benefit for that individual uh, and, and for society. But I would say, by the way, uh, it, it's, it's, ethically dubious to say there's a risk to the individual and a benefit to the society. That's not something that IRBs approve. Uh, the idea of putting you at risk to help other people, um, you know, you can see where that gets bad quickly. Uh, on the other hand, so like my research just can't provide a risk to people. Like, I mean, the research I'm doing, I think it'll help people, but it's not literally saving lives directly. Uh, on the other hand, if you're doing medical research where it could save someone's life, you could also do something risky that, that could risk their life hypothetically. I don't think all of you are going to be in that spot soon. Uh, an important piece here and something I think relevant to all of you is independent review. So when we're looking at these principles and you're like, I don't know, this is a little squishy. Like, how do I make this balance? Um, that's a good point. Like the individual doing the research might be biased. You know, I think my research is great, so I might take a risk. There have to be other independent people who look at my research and say, um, am I balancing things appropriately? Am I putting people at risk? Is there a benefit? And so on. Informed consent is the idea that people should know if they're participating in the study, why and what's going to be collected uh, and so on. So practically for you, I would say it's really important to make sure that people are aware if they're in the study, uh, especially if you're collecting data, um, you know, as far as not having um, a risk to people, you know, like just being aware what would happen if information you collect uh, got released and, and could it cause harm to that individual? Uh, and if there could be harm, how will you mitigate the risk of that data being released or at least mitigate it being appended to that person? So for example, when I worked in industry, I used to collect what we call personally identifiable information. So things like your name or email address uh, or phone number. We used to collect that and I was not too worried about it. As an academic, I tend to remove that data all the time um, uh, if I don't need it for some very important reason. Because then if somehow my data gets released, you know, I drop, you know, someone busts in my email or something like that. If they just know how much people are willing to pay for a t-shirt, but they don't even know who the person is, what harm is going to come to that person, right? Uh, so anyway, those are just really quickly some examples of, of things to keep in mind. Uh, but I do know if you're going to do uh, participant research uh, at high school or college, you'll, you'll probably have to go through the uh, IRB. And I shouldn't say have to, you, you should go through and, it, and, and it, it's a good thing. Uh, but you'll want to think about how do you consent and make sure to, to mitigate risk. Let me yeah, pause. And I think yeah, what, what's, so, yeah, what's so important about that too for, for the MSF students too is that we, we do have the structures in place to support that. And, and again, where there's such um, opportunity with, with behavioral studies. Um, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I think unfortunately, sport, sometimes but. people get they shy away from it then, um, uh, which I think is unfortunate because there's a lot of good work that you can do. Um, uh, the IRB could be pretty easy. I mean, just because they are balancing this risk doesn't mean uh, it's hard to do. For example, uh, well, I can tell you, if we go back to the facial expression study, uh, I submitted an application to the IRB and they actually said they didn't need to review it. I mean, they wanted to review, but they didn't need to monitor the study. And the reason was this, we were using publicly available data um, and, and we weren't reporting results about each individual or something, right? Uh, so they said, there's really no harm and, and you aren't talking about anything that, you know, that anyone doesn't already have. So for example, you could do behavioral research using publicly available data. Um, it's still a good idea to have an independent person review this and just do a reality check, um, right? So any study I do goes to the IRB, but, but sometimes they, they kick it back to me within a couple of days to say, well, thanks for telling us, but this is all okay. You don't need, we don't need to monitor what you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, yeah. another way, if you are collecting from individuals, if somehow you can get it anonymously, it typically makes it um, much less uh, of, a, of a problem now, um, right? Because you often are less likely to, to have a risk of harm. Yeah. Anyway. Awesome. I'm going to have to cut you off and I hate it. That's all right. But I'm going to, um, if you want to take your slides down, yep. if there are any other questions, um, feel free to ask those. Or if there's any last thing that you wanted to make sure you said, Bill. I don't have a last thing. I'd, I'd prefer to answer any questions if someone had one. Oh, I guess, I, well, oh, here's the last thing I can say while people are thinking about it. Um, I'm happy to answer questions now, but if you have questions later uh, or you wanna follow up, you can send, I think uh, I think you all have an email address that they can contact yep. and and and, get put in touch with me and, I, and I'm happy to answer any questions if, if it helps. I appreciate that. It's great. Awesome. I think there's so much more we could talk about, but I really appreciate it. I'm thinking too about like the psychology of when I put things in a virtual shopping cart, how I feel like I own them. And then mm -hmm. I get those ads all the time telling me, don't forget you have this here. That's right. Don't forget, forget. I don't need it. <laughs> so it was not me, but it might be some of the students I've trained. Yes, probably. So I feel manipulated, but I appreciate the effort. So thank you very much, um, everyone. Thank you, Bill. Yep. Uh, thank you. Nice meeting you all.